Okay. Hi, everybody. Dr. LJ here. And uh, we have a speaker that we've been waiting for for a long time, Lindsay Webb. And before we get started, um, this is a very unique time right now because we are actually recording this on on March 18th, 2020, and there are a couple significant things about this date. First of all, we officially, as of today, are starting our eighth year with the Natural Wellness Academy. So I'm excited that you're here with us today on our, uh, just we just completed our seven year anniversary and starting our eighth year. And eight for me has always been like a really special number. Um, the other thing is that this is a time that, you know, uh, webinars are probably our best bet for getting together because we are in the time right now that they're just starting to tell us that we should spend as much time isolated from other people for the coronavirus. So I think it's a great time to, to learn. And um, I'm just about to publish an, a blog about this tomorrow. And, and it really is about focusing body, mind, spirit. And that's what we're all about. And also we're going to, uh, Jamie and I are having a discussion tomorrow on how the Natural Wellness Academy and how all of us can offer our services to people to help them feel better and really be a shining light in the world. So Lindsay, thank you so much for being a part of this. And I'm gonna introduce you now, this is Lindsay Webb. And she has just an extraordinary amount of knowledge in so many different of the integrative and holistic fields. Um, uh, she was involved um, in being a gathering leader and working hard in Oregon to get the word out about cannabis. Um, she now belongs to the Central Florida. I think she's in a board position of normal. So she is also a wonderful expert in the field of cannabis. And this is something that I really, you know, we, we always, Lindsay, like to do a lot of compare and contrast. And we will get people, you know, when you are a cannabis coach, you will get people probably asking you about some of the psychoactive. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about microdosing, uh, especially the mushrooms. We've been hearing a lot of people doing ayahuasca. I even have information about that in the course and how different they are. So you are what's called an entheogenic practitioner. You, you're a practitioner of entheogenic medicine, and you work with people for trauma release and also kind of getting more in tune with their spirituality and you work with a lot of women's issues. So I will let you take it from there. Okay, well, I just wanted to say um, hello to everyone. And like I said, LJ, I can only see you unless someone talks. So I don't know um, how to change that view. So what I'm gonna do is as people introduce themselves, I will then kind of say hi if they want to. So if there's someone here that wants to um, kind of tell what their experience level is, I don't want to take, you know, a, a bunch of our time um, doing a, a lengthy introduction, but if you, you know, feel comfortable and you want to tell me like, hey, I've never heard of them or, hey, I've taken them before or something like that, it gives me kind of an idea of, of what type of information I'm going to need to share additionally. I I think unless somebody who's come in recently, for the most part, other than Lauren, um, I did have an experience once myself with the mushrooms. It was a very unpleasant experience. So it is not something that I really want to be. Uh, you know, I think I, I'm fascinated by the idea of microdosing because I didn't like the whole psychedelic. And I have, of course, you know, I'm a baby boomer. So I have tried LSD in the past. I had one very good experience and a couple very bad experiences. So I'm not anxious to go the route of psychedelics, but I do love the idea of microdosing and I really want to learn from you. If anybody else, let me see, there's somebody in the chat box maybe that wants to say. Yeah. 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 That's I think helpful. Most of the people, yes. Yeah. Because I'm seeing it as a different view, but I'm seeing you as the main one. And that means that it's probably recording that way. I'm hoping at least it's recording, but definitely we will have your presentation front and center when you start, sure. you know, that. So go ahead. I'm going to, I'm actually going to sure, go ahead and get started then here. So, um, I'm going to uh, talk about myself throughout the presentation. Um, it just kind of works a little bit better for me. I want to tie certain information in uh, to what I'm saying. Can everyone hear me? Well, we're all muted, but I can hear you very well. You can hear me. Okay, good. As long as you can hear me, that's great. Okay, going back to my um, share my screen then. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, here we are. 
Um, so welcome to microdosing psychedelics and entheogens. My name is Lindsay Webb and as LJ said, I'm an entheogenic medicine practitioner and um, that's something that you'll learn the definition of as we go along. Um, I wanted to just start um, with some intention setting like Lauren mentioned earlier. One of the things that you will hear over and over again um, in the settings with these medicines is uh, about set and setting. So um, that just means getting your environment comfortable. Um, if you there's music you'd like to listen to, um, there's any kind of aromatherapy you'd like to use, make sure you have a drink, you know, just kind of get yourself centered and ready. If you are someone who um, uses spiritual tools, that's a time to use them as well, but it doesn't, it's not required. Um, so my intention for this webinar is that it will guide you through the typical intake and treatment process that I follow, as well as provide resources for you to coach others should you choose. And I intend for you to learn something of value and for at least one person to feel inspired to work with Entheogen. So if everyone will just take a moment and um, set an intention of your own, you can close your eyes, take a couple deep breaths, just kind of get yourself centered and ready. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to start off with some basics, um, some basic information. So we're all working with the same um, information as we go into the different medicines. So um, what are psychedelics? Um, psychedelic is a term that was coined by a British doctor named Humphrey Osmond in 1957. It refers to a consciousness expanding psychoactive substance that produces sensory changes. It's derived from the Greek word psyche, meaning mind and delos meaning manifesting. So in direct translation, it's manifesting of the mind. And I think that's you know somewhat of a pretty good description of um, the type of activity that it has on, on the mind and the body. Um, some psychedelics do produce hallucinations. Those are also referred to as hallucinogens. Major psychedelics include mescaline, which is typically from cacti, LSD, which is synthesized in a lab, psilocybin, which typically comes from mushrooms, and DMT, which um, can be humanly made, but also comes from plants as well. Many people are now using the term entheogen in place of the term psychedelic. Um, there are various reasons for that. Um, it's partially because of the association that you think of maybe recreational drug use, and a lot of entheogenic practitioners are wanting to expand the use of these medicines because they're very, very effective for physical ailments, and they're also very effective for psychological, emotional, or spiritual ailments, if you will. Um, so Albert Hoffman, uh, he's a Swiss chemist that was best known for synthesizing LSD. He first synthesized LSD in 1938. And it was by isolating a fungus called ergo that grows on rye. There are a couple of medications to this day that we use that are based on his um, other synthesizations that he did with that particular fungus. And one prevents uh, hemorrhaging, bleeding during hemorrhaging, and is used for women who um, sometimes have uh, bleeding after childbirth or during childbirth. So he definitely contributed a lot to um, modern medicine in, in many ways. In 1958, he synthesized psilocybin and psilocin, which are both um, in mushrooms, basically. So using samples of psilocybin mexicana, which is a certain type of mushroom that was sent to him by an amateur mycologist who was fascinated by his work. So essentially, one of his fans, if you will, in modern terms, sent him this sample, and he was able to synthesize the psilocybin and the psilocin, and this is actually um, was kind of the starting point for our modern use. In 1979, he published an autobiography called LSD, My Problem Child, detailing his accidental trip while working with his newly discovered substance. So as he was synthesizing LSD in the lab and he was handling it, he started to feel really funny. And um, he details the entire trip, if you will, in his book. And um, I've read some of it. And it's, pretty, it's pretty funny and entertaining. So if you ever want to check that out, be a good read. Um, so he goes on this wild trip, and of course, he didn't have anyone to explain to him what to expect like we do. 
So I can imagine that was that was quite the interesting um, experience for him. Um, he is the one who was pretty adamant that psychedelic medicines could provide therapeutic relief for symptoms of schizophrenia and other psychological disorders. And he is absolutely correct about that. So, so I mentioned the term um, entheogen, and um, entheogen is a term that was coined in 1979 by a team of ethnobotanists and mythologists, including Gordon Lawson, Richard Schultz, Karl Rock, and others. It is derived from the Greek words entheos, meaning full of the divine, and genocide, meaning to come into being. Translated, entheogen means bringing forth the divine within. This new term was meant to expand the definition of psychedelic medicine to include shamanic and indigenous use, and to allow for a new image following the stigmas of recreational use of psychedelics in the 60s and 70s. And as I said, even though entheogen is a term that refers to, um, it alludes to some sort of a higher power, or some sort of a spiritual force, or, or however you want to see it, I just want to be very clear that these medicines are for everyone, you know, to access no matter what your uh, spiritual beliefs are, no matter what your religious beliefs are, that is not a barrier and should not be a barrier to approaching these medicines because um, the use of them uh, for spirituality is so powerful and has become so common. You will often read articles and things when you're researching that are going to almost make it seem like it always has to be done that way. And I feel that as long as you're respectful um, to the medicine, to its origins and things like that, that you can use it for practical purposes as well without having to make that attachment. So I just want everyone to feel you know, that they can access this medicine. Um, what is microdosing? So microdosing in terms of psychedelic or entheogenic medicine refers to the practice of taking sub-threshold doses, approximately 1 20th to 1 10th of a macro dose on a daily basis for a period of time. So someone shared with us a little while ago that they took um, a couple of grams of psilocybin mushrooms and that's a macro dose for sure. Um, so a micro dose of a psilocybin mushroom might be like a 10th of a gram, depending on the type that you have in the strength. So not necessarily very much at all if you're wanting to micro dose. So it's very important when we do get legal access to these medicines that we are um, following trusted people to um, guide us because um, more is not always better in microdosing. You know, we're, we want to take just enough to get the job done and we want to expose ourselves to that medicine. You know, we do different things. So you may take it for three days in a row and you may um, not take it again for three days. You may do a week on, a week off. There's all different types of uh, methodology that we can use for dosing. Um, Recipients typically do not experience noticeable side effects, yet are able to benefit from the therapeutic compounds within the substance. And microdosing allows the medicines to be accessed by more people for more reasons. So um, my personal story will come in a little bit here. So in my case, um, I am a single mom. I have a teenager and a preschooler who will soon be a kindergartner. And I am truly a single parent. I have very, very little um, in-person help. Um, and I don't have family here. So uh, for me, I would not be able to access a lot of these medicines if I did not have the option of microdosing and if some of them weren't legal and available to me. So um, I know the way that they've changed my life. And so it's become my job now to uh, work with these medicines as I feel called to and to work with other people who know far more than me so that we can um, get access to these medicines to more people. So later on, we'll talk a little bit about how you can help us um, with some legalization efforts as well, if that's something you're interested in. Okay. So before we go into mushrooms, I just want to pause and ask if anybody has any questions. I'm going to um, let's see, see if I can pop up our window again. Maybe I stop sharing. Okay. There. Are you able to hear and see me now? I can't hear you for some reason. Okay. 
Now I unmuted myself. Sorry, I was I was uh, clicking on the icon and not the unmute. Okay, we we see in the group you see in the chat that um, the Jennifer Miles is here and that she's had a lot of experience over the twenty years. If anybody would like to either uh, type something into the chat, be my guest, or if you'd like to open up your mic uh, to ask a question at this point, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, Lindsay, you can move on. Okay. We got a second. All right, seems like everybody's okay. So we'll go back, start with our mushrooms here. Okay, so mushrooms. I know that that's um, what many of you are, are very interested in hearing about. Um, mushrooms um, are, well, psychedelic mushrooms contain psilocybin and psilocin. And so psilocybin is classified as a Schedule I drug in the U.S., meaning that it has no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Um, I obviously do not agree with this at all. However, this is the um, state of things legally, uh, federally at this time. Um, now, there have been cities throughout the country who have decriminalized uh, entheogens in different you know, types. And so like Oakland, California, they're decriminalized. Um, there's just many other cities, Denver, that are getting on board. And there's a really special resource I wanna share with you at the end that is um, called Decriminalized Nature. And they're the organization that has um, been at the center of all these efforts. And so if you're wanting to know how you can support or how you can learn more, I really suggest that you um, look into it. I, I here in Tampa am absolutely happy to gather with anybody if they're ready, but I've been kind of waiting until I had a group of people so that we could get some momentum. Um, but I'm connected with them, and you know, would happy to be happy to lead that movement here if, if we feel like we're ready to um, to put some energy into it. Potential uses for mushrooms, and this is as um, in microdose, is depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, specifically uh, cluster headaches, some types of migraines. Um, addiction, end of life, uh, psychological distress, and cancer. And so I think that the end of life psychological distress is a particularly um, important and special thing that microdosing of mushrooms can do. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why uh, research is opening up because you know there's certain groups of people, children, depending on what the medicine is, or you know, people who are terminally ill or chronically ill, they, they sometimes are um, the situation that will open up a pathway for everyone to access a medicine. So in this case, um, the hospice type use is actually one of the things that it um, allowed us to start to get some research opened up for these substances. So I thought that was just very interesting. And also it's typically, mushrooms can be very, very good. Psilocybin can be very, very good for dealing with the emotional roller coaster of a terminal illness or of a chronic illness. You know, it's not always, the healing's not always able to be extracted and say, well, this thing does this and this thing does that. A lot of these work synergistically together. Um, I'm a big uh, proponent of careful um, combination use of cannabis, whether it's CBD or THC and some of these medicines, um, but you definitely want to make sure that you are well informed before you experiment at home with certain things. So serotonin um, agonist is what psilocybin is basically. Um, I didn't go heavy into the science here, but I am going to give you some resources so that you can do as much nerding out as you want, or if you're not really someone who wants to get that deep into research, you know, you can read some of the articles that surmise some of the research. And so that'll give you a way to control a lot of the information they're taking. And I don't want to overwhelm those that are new because it's a lot to take in, in in one hour. So um, basically the process that happens inside the brain is essentially the same as what an SSRI does. I hear somebody, do you have a question? No, so but I would SSRI. like to point out just that an SSRI is what they use for antidepressants. That's when Zoloft came on the market, that that's what it, it's, um, what happens is that the serotonin is taken up by the neurons and the person, it's taken up so much that they're not, they're not able to feel serotonin. So what an SSRI does is that it inhibits that reuptake so that serotonin can flood the brain. 
Just wanted to clarify yes. that. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, LJ. LJ. No, you're absolutely correct. That's exactly what it is. So SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. And that's exactly what LJ just explained to us is what that actually is. So it actually inhibits the serotonin that's been released into the synapse from reabsorbing into the cell that it came from and allows it to have more time and more likelihood to absorb into the, um, the cell on the other side. And so that's how you're getting that neurological connection in the brain for the serotonin to do the process that it's supposed to do. So essentially, this is a natural version of prescription um, SSRIs. And as LJ said, there are a class of antidepressants that are commonly prescribed in the U.S. So that's all that I actually have in the slides for psilocybin because, um, I, because of the legal implications of conversations of this nature, it's really something that is hard to share a lot of information about. Um, all I can really say is that if it's something that you're wanting to work with, um, despite the potential legal challenges or just other challenges it could present, I just really, really encourage you to um, talk to someone who has experience and has experience guiding other people if you have that option. Um, it's something that um, you could have someone sit with you and hold space for you while you do it. So you could do something yourself and you could just have someone there with you and that would be okay. That's another way that sometimes um, other practitioners will guide people who are wanting to try this. I'm really hoping that we get some decriminalization uh, momentum because um, I'd really love to be able to open up my practice fully to this because it, it just has absolutely so much potential. And I'll just share something with you that um, the research will probably need to catch up on, but I know that this is true and I think we'll see this as we do more research. Um, psilocybin has a lot of potential as an ADD and ADHD treatment. Um, and there are people who have found a lot of success uh, in autistic loved ones as well. So again, I'm, you know, obviously we all need to be very careful and mindful um, of legalities and, and safety and things like that, but I really would encourage you to help with decriminalization efforts if that's something you are interested in, because that's how we can uh, open this up and get access so we can all work with this medicine. Well, Lindsay, Lindsay, going back, what, what might be really helpful for all of us, can you, okay, so you guide people through the mushroom experience, yes. through combo, through some of the other things you're going to discuss. Can you uh -huh. kind of maybe give us, um, maybe, without giving names, of course, like a little case history uh -huh. of what you've witnessed happening with one oh, of yeah. your entheogenic clients using the mushrooms? Yes, so um, I will just um, anonymously report um, some things that I have been privy to in some manner. So. Um, Okay, so one of, like I said, it is just like taking an SSRI in, in microdose form. So um, you literally often can feel the serotonin dump almost, and uh, that automatically starts to reset, you know, the chemical balance in the brain. Um, a lot of times um, I feel like emotional processing becomes a lot easier. People tend to make a lot of uh, progress in processing emotional trauma. Um, one of the best ways to microdose uh, this particular medicine, if you're, if you're just wanting to do like therapeutic um, emotional type work, is to really do daily work with yourself. So you would work with a practitioner to determine a safe dose, and you would probably ultimately have to choose that yourself because, again, we're, our hands are tied to an extent on how we can coach, as you know. So um, you could... Um, be begin a protocol where you were taking it daily or as recommended or whatever. And throughout that time, you're going to have small shifts day to day. And each person's going to be very different. So um, it depends on what you're wanting to work on. So say you're wanting to work on, maybe you've been, feel like your emotions are all over the place and you just feel really unbalanced and you feel like maybe you've been snapping at people you shouldn't or you've been just taking things harder than you wish or, or however you, you want to phrase it. So um, doing some microdosing for a short period of time could potentially balance that out for you. And one of the cool things that it can do is give you sort of a detached observer type of feeling. And I think that's what someone, you know, was talking about earlier. 
is that um, it gives you the ability uh, to almost remote view yourself sometimes, and a lot of these medicines do. And so as you are encountering a situation where perhaps you would have maybe reacted a certain way in the past, you may find that, wow, I didn't react to that trigger or, or whatever, that situation. And then you kind of sit back and you reflect, and then you start to sort of get these uh, kind of insights into how you're interacting with other people, um, how you're kind of moving around in the world. Um, sometimes sleep is improved greatly through use of these medicines, and, and psilocybin is definitely one of them. Is, that um, the one, is, this the, is this the one that increases creativity? That it's one of the ones that does. Okay. It's one of the ones that does. Yeah, so, so it increases creativity. So what we know is, okay, so let's go back to nature. Let's start like going back to nature. So if we look at a mushroom and we think of fungi, what do fungi do? So fungi carry messages from trees and, I mean, that's, we don't know a whole lot yet, but from trees for sure, and I'm sure that they probably carry messages from other, um, other living things. But they actually carry trees from messages to other trees. Fungi are like an underground neural network that just expands and grows and makes new branches and new connections. And so if you think about that action in your brain, um, you are chemically and neurologically uh, building your plasticity. You're building your ability to focus if that's what you want. You're building your ability to be more creative in your creative work. You're just really giving, as they say in, in, in my world, they say you're giving, you're giving yourself branches. You're growing branches on your tree. And so that's what mushrooms specifically are good for. Um, we'll that's talk. Excellent. We'll talk about other medicines. Yeah. So so yeah. And so a lot of this is anecdotal type stuff, but I will share as much as I can analogy wise to try and help you understand. So if you have a question, please ask because I usually have a lot of weird analogies I can use to kind of <laughs> try to try to explain things. So um, so yeah. So that's definitely one you would use for creativity. It's definitely one you would use for focus. I have a client who reported to me that they would not have graduated from law school if they had not microdosed mushrooms the entire time. And my take on this person after knowing them for a while is that they self-medicated ADD throughout their law school career and throughout college. And they were successful and have lasting effects they feel um, neurologically from that time period in their life. That is so amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, really, well, we, really can, we can move on to combo now. I just wanted, I just thought that would be fun for us <laughs> to have uh, some of that anecdotal information. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So one of my favorites um, is this frog here. Um, and I will say that combo is not tech, it's, it's an entheogen because it has a release of the inner divinity, if you will. Um, it has a lot of practical uses. Some people do not consider it an entheogen. It is definitely not a psychedelic. It does not have psychoactive effects. It's not visionary. It's not hallucinatory. So you do not, it's a little bit different. It doesn't work quite like that. But the reason I wanted to share combo with you is because it can do some amazing things. And like I said, I do consider it to be an entheogen. Um, so combo or frog medicine, combo is a term commonly used to refer to the secretion of the phylomedusa bicolor frog. It's also called the giant leaf frog or the giant monkey frog. The secretion itself is called kampuk, but while the frog and the animal spirit associated it with it are called combo. So you're going to hear a lot of terms thrown around when you're doing research on this medicine. Sometimes you'll hear it called sapo. The frogs are sometimes called sapo frogs. There's just a lot of dialects throughout the world and a lot of people from other countries using these medicines. So for uh, just the ease of today, we're going to call the medicine combo, whether we're talking about the frog or whether we're talking about the secretion itself. But just so you know, the secretion itself actually has a little bit different name. Combo frogs are indigenous to the Amazon. They do not produce a secretion when kept in captivity. Therefore, ethical harvesting of this medicine is essential for it to continue to exist. Um, this is something that is incredibly near and dear to my heart and incredibly important. Um, the tribes that we source this medicine from are very gentle with the frogs. They um, only collect the secretions at night. Um, they're very gentle with the frogs. The frogs are not stressed or harmed. There are other medicines you will hear about, primarily from a toad, where you may hear that they have to stress the animal or whatever. We're not going to talk about that today, um, but combo is, 
is usually uh, ethically collected. It, it's not something that's been contaminated largely as far as that goes, but it's also why practitioners are very careful about how they pass this medicine on, um, because we're wanting to protect the origin of it. And also the indigenous tribes that are um, supplying us with this medicine, it's really important that we take good care of them and let them stay to their way of life and we preserve that for them. So this is kind of a, ba a bad, you know, clarity because it's so blown up. But what I wanted to show you is this is a close-up of a combo stick. And so I don't know if you can see like how it's white. That's shiny. It looks like a lacquer that's dried onto a wooden stick and it kind of almost looks cracked the way like a lacquer would. Um, and so the secretion when it's applied is actually rehydrated with water and it becomes like a paste and little chunks of the paste are put onto um, the spots on your, uh, on your skin. And I'll explain to you that whole process in just a moment. So combo contains at least 16 bioactive peptides. We've already identified at least 16 of them. Um, some of these peptides work powerfully on human opiate receptor systems. So users uh, for that purpose report decreased pain and inflammation. Combo causes a massive detox by flushing the lymphatic system. Um, so just to share a little bit of my own personal story here. So when I had my youngest child about five years ago, um, I sustained a very serious back injury through the delivery. It wasn't from an epidural. It was actually from a physical injury from something the doctor felt he needed to do. And I really think that it was malpractice, but that's, uh, not really here nor there at this point, but however, it was a very serious injury. Um, soon I had two herniated discs in my lower back. They were uh, pinching my sciatic 70 and 80% respectively. I had the most excruciating, horrific nerve pain down one of my legs. I couldn't carry my baby up the stairs um, and I was prescribed opiates while breastfeeding my child. And I was told that that was safe. And my nurse practitioner had actually worked for the La Leche League, which is obviously a, you know, been around for forever and is a standard in, in breastfeeding. So for her to have worked for them and, you know, for this to have been what I was told to do, I, you know, I did it. You know, I did what I was told by, by the doctors at that point. Um, so in recovering myself and healing myself, cannabis was a big influence, but so was Combo. Um, I, when I started to use Combo, I started to really see results. Um, I started to have massive reduction in pain and inflammation. And uh, often you'll do a three-day treatment for something like this. So like you would maybe have a, um, a treatment every morning for three days. And when you do something like that, you can do it in a little bit gentler amount. And it's a little bit um, easier on the body. People who are super toxic, maybe who have autoimmune disorders or something like that, or maybe have used prescription medication for a long time, they really need a gentle practitioner because it's going to detox the liver as well. And um, you can have that Herxheimer effect sometimes if you have chronic illness. And so you need a practitioner who understands how to work with you and how to listen to your body. Um, so, but yeah, but it's a powerful medicine for, for many things. So other reported uses for combo include addiction. Um, many people find that uh, it reduces or removes cravings. Now, obviously, as we know about addiction, you know, it's going to take a lot of other things than just the combo, but it's a beautiful tool. If someone is, is detoxing and going into treatment and, you know, wants to get that stuff fully out of their system, or maybe they've done treatment and they just want to make sure they're not really having cravings and they've detoxed maybe their organs after their treatment, something like that. Those are the kind of people you can work with. Um, when you are working with someone who is taking medications, whether it's uh, illicit drugs or whether it's prescription medication, you do want to make sure that the practitioner is screening you. There are contraindications with certain medicines and there are contraindications with certain heart problems. So just any kind of practitioner that you're going to find for any of these medicines, make sure that they are thoroughly checking with you and that you feel just like you would at a doctor like you have gotten a really good consultation, if you will. Um, and then you should feel comfortable trusting that person at that point. And please ask questions and, and make sure that you're expressing anything that you feel is very important. So other uses include anxiety and depression, uh, infertility, cancer, and autoimmune disorders such as Crohn's and fibromyalgia. So I also had adrenal fatigue very severely and also was diagnosed with fibromyalgia at the time. So uh, I have been able to 
be symptom free as long as I keep to diet, exercise, and I have combo treatments on a fairly regular basis, like once every few months or so. So that's my personal experience um, with, with combo specifically. This is a picture of a typical ceremony setup. What you're going to find with a lot of combo practitioners is you're going to find a lot of uh, language that's around uh, ceremony and a lot of sacredness and a lot of um, just gratitude. And as I said before, if this makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable because you're not familiar with it or you think that it maybe contradicts with you know, your belief system, I would just encourage you to chat with a practitioner beforehand. I absolutely modify um, my ceremonial method in the beginning to um, include what that person is comfortable with. My set and setting always includes music that they're wanting. You know, we talk about, do they want me to set up an altar? Because a lot of times people get kind of freaked out by some of the stuff and they feel like they're maybe subscribing to some sort of worship or something that they're not unsure, that they're not sure of. And I just want to assure you that it may look interesting like this, but that's not really what you know, has to occur. So to show you um, kind of top down, there's a candle there, as you can see, um, some feathers. A lot of times a practitioner has items that maybe they've been gifted um, by other practitioners, by their mentors, by tribes, people. Um, ethical trading hopefully is going on and, and putting some money back into um, some of these tribes. So this cloth that's here is um, a woven cloth. And I don't know the exact origins of this, but from looking at the patterning, it looks like Shipibo tribal um, weaving to me. So it's a certain style. And um, a lot of their visionary art comes directly from their ayahuasca use. And so when you use uh, ayahuasca or some of these medicines, you'll see in your vision certain patterns, and they often will mimic these same patterns. And people who have never seen these patterns report the same thing. So it almost seems to be universal patterns that you see um, sometimes. So some of these patterns may look familiar to you if you've used these medicines or if you use them in the future. Um, obviously, there are some frog-related items sitting there, crystal. Um, if you look below the pewter or whatever frog that is in the center and you look below that there's a crystal laying sideways underneath that is something called a mapacho cigarette so uh, mapacho is a certain type of tobacco that grows in the amazon it is uh, ceremonially used to help with the purge um, physically it just makes you want to throw up so it's good for that but spiritually speaking the tobacco spirits um, that specific kind of tobacco is supposed to have a strong wish protective so it'll be used in a shamanic sense to um, aid you in releasing negativity is what they, their purpose for it is below that you're going to see two combo sticks they're both wrapped in uh, the leaves they come wrapped like that and you undo everything and the tribe literally packages it up for you so it feels really special and, and just rare when you get it so you open that up and, and the stick is inside so uh, the item below that is called a tepi and it is something that you use an applicator that you use to blow shamanic snuff made from plants into a recipient's nose um, that is something that um, I don't have in here in this uh, presentation because I, I didn't think we would have enough time but it is something that I am able to um, safely and knowledgeably share with you if you're interested and you're local to me. Um, it's just another type of medicine. Actually, there's many, many kinds of made with different plants. Some contain tobacco, some do not. People report that they are able to um, kick nicotine habits for good by building a healthy relationship with some of the snuffs of the mapacho cigarettes. So it's often used uh, kind of an addiction recovery for things like that because you can learn a new way. And that's what I do as well. I sometimes will teach people like a new way to use Kratom because I have some, you know, personal thoughts on the liver toxicity of it and long-term use and some things like that. So I do work with people who uh, use Kratom. I teach them how to grow it. I teach them how to interact with the plant and also then to be easier on their body when they're using it to use it a little bit more purposefully and um, maybe use less. So, you know, there's lots of ways. Lindsay, it's possible. Use. It's possible that people don't know what Kratom is. I know that some people do. So you might want to just mention it. Okay. So it's not one of the, you, would you consider Kratom to be in the entheogenic, uh, you know, category? Um, I, you know, I'm not going to say it's not an entheogen, but I personally do not think it has that purpose in the plant medicine community and the spiritual side of things. Um, so it's, 
really does not serve like a purpose in this world that I am in. But that being said, Kratom is a plant that grows in Indonesia and it has alkaloids in the uh, plant that um, are typically used in place of opiates or for chronic fatigue. And because it's legal here, it's widely accessible. Um, I've noticed here in Florida specifically that it's very commonly used. People often use it instead of like Suboxone or something um, when they are um, coming off of like heroin addictions or, or just even prescription addictions. Um, whether those are, you know, taking as directed or not, you can still become addicted. So the problem I have is that you're typically starting with a toxified liver and then you're doing more damage to the liver. And it's really not meant to be taken every day as pain relief. It's something you would use instead of maybe narcotics if you had surgery or something and you were in recovery. It, it does activate opiate receptors, but I feel that it um, stimulates opiate receptors. And I have a, a lot of reason to believe from experience with people that it is not safe for people who have had addictions at any point in time because it ends up being trading one addiction for another. It causes you to manufacture pain the way opiates can. A lot of the things that opiates can do to your mind that are bad, it can also do to your mind. That's so interesting. Really I, have nev I, I had never known that about Kratom. I'm so glad. Go ahead and then move on to the other ones if you want to. I just sure. wanted to ask you on that. Sure, sure. Yeah, no problem. So, okay, so that's that. So um, as we were talking about, Combo requires an experienced practitioner. It's not appropriate for self-application until after you've been trained and approved by a mentor. So even for me and my path, I received combo from many people over a period of time. Then I was given permission and training to begin to self-serve myself. And I used that self-service time to begin my uh, training. And then I also trained with other practitioners um, before I began giving it to other people. So it's something that has a, a very distinct uh, process that goes along with it. All right, let's get on to something a little bit more fun, which is ayahuasca. So here in this picture, what you're seeing is you're seeing shredded vine, you're seeing leaves, um, and they're gonna be filled with water and boiled down into a tea-like ceremonial substance. So ayahuasca is a ceremonial tea made of at least two plants, one containing DMT such as chacruna, and the other is a vine called Banisteriopsis caffi. Ayahuasca is a term used to describe the vine alone and to describe the psychoactive visionary tea described above. So that's another thing when you're researching, you're going to read ayahuasca, ayahuasca all over creation. And what we're gonna talk about primarily is microdosing the vine only. And so you may hear that called ayahuasca or you may be reading articles and research about the DMT containing portion of it. So we, um, we do not have access legally to ayahuasca, but we do legally have access to the cappy vine. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, so we're going to call the vine and the medicine made from it cappy. Cappy grows naturally in the Amazon jungle, and it can also be grown here in South Central Florida. This is the plant that I, when I first moved here, connected with some fellow medicine people who had found a vine. It looked a lot like this. And this vine had been growing in a woman's yard in Clearwater for 12 years. Her husband had been a bit of a psycho knot, and she didn't really understand a lot of stuff he was into. And he got a cutting uh, from Terrence McKenna. Um, who you may want to look up. He's um, just, he, he's well known as an American who brought ayahuasca and, and cappy um, to the States from the jungle. And, and a lot of people follow him and, and are very into his teachings. So um, anyway, her husband had gotten a cutting of this and it had taken over their entire quarter acre yard in mass, in a mass canopy. It grows along other trees and things. And it had actually taken out the transformer and the city was going to find her, and that's how these people found her. And so I was able to go in and help extract just kilos of this mature 12-year-old vine. So it was, it was quite the experience. I've made medicine from it, which I've taken myself, um, and that's part of my journey into um, becoming someone who guides others in this medicine. So Banisteriopsis cappy, the vine is legal in the U.S. and many other countries. However, ayahuasca is not. Microdosing a liquid form of this medicine is the natural version of an MAOI. It's what's called a reversible MAOI. So that, um, LJ, maybe you can help me here. It's a minoxo something something inhibitor, correct? Well, actually what happens is, is that if you take ayahuasca on its own, 
you're not going to feel the effects of it because it's a similar thing. You know, you have that reuptake uh, receptor that is going to, well, it basically it, it acts as an agonist, so you're not gonna feel any effects. And it is the, the CAPI, I guess is what it's called, that um, activates the, the MAU, you know, the, that's, that's the, um, I think that's the uh, uptake. Yeah, so the microdosing right? the CAPI, right, so microdose, microdosing the CAPI, the CAPI itself is the MAO. Right. right. So it, it is the one, like you said, you're not, so what it does is it actually allows, the, it actually allows the DMT to not be destroyed in the digestive tract when you take ceremonial ayahuasca. That's so exactly it also what serves. Yeah. Yeah, it also serves that purpose. But in microdosing form of vine only, what you're going to find typically is the kinds of uh, good effects that you would have from a prescription antidepressant of the MAOI class. Um, the great thing about this natural MAOI is that you don't have to prescribe to a restricted diet like you do for prescription MAOIs. I believe grapefruit juice is contraindicated. So, I mean, there's, it's definitely safer, and because it's reversible and it's more natural, the body processes it better, and you just, I feel like in the future we're going to start seeing, um, once they start doing more clinical trials, we're going to see that it's a lot easier um, for people to handle, especially people who have trouble with antidepressants like me. I, I have terrible side effects when I took restricted antidepressants. I've almost lost jobs. I've almost ruined my life many times from the side effects. It's been, it, was a, it was a rough road for me. So um, CAPI contains three main alkaloids called harmine, tetra, hydroharmine, and harmaline. These alkaloids are believed to be responsible for the therapeutic effects in both micro and macro doses. Um, this is a, a slice of the vine, and so I know in wellness, you talk about things like, uh, does this not kind of remind you of the way the inside of a walnut look? And when we open a walnut, we talk about how it's really good for the brain. And so if you look at this slice of cappy here, it kind of looks like walnutty, kind of brainish in there. And it kind of looks like it has a lot of connections going on in there. So it kind of gives us a little hint as to what it might be able to help us with and what it's good for. It also um, creates neuroplasticity. Um, it also is great for emotional um, therapeutic use. Um, it's very safe for you to microdose on your own at home with very light guidance from me or someone else. Um, I usually seek to empower people to be um, navigating this medicine on their own with first thing that I share with them. Um, within a month's time, obviously each person's different and we can, I can continue to help if needed. But this is a super easy one to access and it's legal and it does a lot of similar things to psilocybin. So it's, it's why I wanted to focus on it a little bit tonight. Um, so reported therapeutic effects for microdosers of CAPI only liquid are better quality sleep. That's a very common one. You will have very, very common report of better quality sleep. Um, improvement or cessation of depression symptoms. So people just like psilocybin who have had chronic depression, who have had um, hard to treat or impossible to treat, um, people who sometimes have suicidal ideations with prescription medications can be a better candidate for these. Again, good practitioner, definitely want to do lots of screening. Um, more balanced mood, less severe highs and lows, slowing and or the improvement of Parkinson's disease. So both psilocybin and the CAPI both show promise in treating Alzheimer's and dementia as well. Um, combinations of these medicines have been used to cure cancer many times. That doesn't mean that it will cure everyone's cancer. Um, and I certainly am not qualified to do something like that, but I know people that are. Um, so if you know anybody who's interested, I, I have resources and people that are, are literally experts in each specific discipline. So I can get you some really good people to talk to if you want more information for someone who's not well. Um, I have had skin cancer heal from it, and so have many other people. I had probably what was technically precancerous growth on my uh, face and uh, moved back to Florida and probably wasn't using enough sunscreen and everything. And um, I was able to heal that by taking the microdose liquid under my tongue. I never applied it topically, though people do for more severe situations. So there's a, a lot that can be done with this. Um, like I said, I think that the Parkinson's research specifically and the dementia research and things like that are, are gonna be super important for our future. Um, one more thing I wanna talk a little bit about is mescaline. So mescaline is the, um, the psychedelic you know, component of uh, mostly cacti. 
And so what you see here uh, is a beautiful picture here of um, some peyote um, buttons. And you can see it's got a lovely little flower there. And um, so peyote is a mescaline containing um, cacti. Um, it grows naturally in Southern Texas and parts of Mexico. Mescaline is a psychoactive substance that causes visions. And due to the sacred nature of peyote used to tribes such as the Navajo and the potential impact of unnecessary use on the already shrinking supply, it's recommended seekers choose other forms of mescaline containing cacti such as San Pedro, Peruvian or Bolivian torch. Mescaline is a schedule one drug in the US Certain religious uses are allowed. These are primarily associated with Native American tribal medicine. So my reason for um, bringing peyote up and making this statement is because uh, if someone is seeking to use this, like I said, it's definitely a Schedule One drug, so there, there are some you know, challenges with that. But if someone's seeking to use masculine, I just ask that we all continue on this message to remind them that it is best to choose something other than peyote. It takes a very long time to grow. It can be grown in captivity, but um, indigenous access is not even remotely where it ought to be at this time. And so this is just something that we have to steward very carefully. And at the end in the resources, I will um, put a link to the Native American churches um, statement, their direct statement on this. And this is a concern because we're uh, decriminalizing entheogens. And typically when you do those activities, you name out the ones you want to be decriminalized. And they have asked us specifically not to name peyote in any efforts that we can definitely say mescaline or cacti or whatever, but they don't want it singled out because they don't want to bring any attention to it um, as a trend right now because it could be dangerous for it. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave it on resources here for a minute. Um, and See if there's anybody who wants to maybe copy some things down. Obviously, this will be available later. And so in just a second, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up for us to chat for a bit and for everyone to kick it off. Okay. Let me go back here to where I was. There and you just need to turn your... Um, your video on again because we see your name but we don't see your pretty face. Here you Hello, are. Hello, <laughs> everyone. Okay, so I'm gonna go down here and just kind of look a little bit because I wasn't able to view the group chat while I was sharing and I want to make sure I'm catching up with everybody. Oh good, all this good stuff, yay. Okay, um, okay, so I see people have experience, that's fantastic. So let me ask you though, you, you, you do take people through these guided tours of the entheogenic medicine, correct? Uh -huh. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you, how would they contact you? Um, I have the last slide has my information. Um, you can email me if you would like. And the email address is, the, is three words put together as one, all lowercase. So love magic medicine i'll put it in the chat thing here i'm, I'm typing it right now for you hun at, at oh, love magic medicine at, at gmail.com okay i've got that there and they also, can also find you through five can they uh friend you on facebook too and yes yeah, that's you, exactly what i was about to say thank you so i um I, you're welcome to friend me on facebook just please send me a little message and let me know why and where just because sometimes i get weird ones and i don't want to ignore somebody that's coming from this space so i want to make sure they don't see you so um let's see here what else is going on in the messages let's see okay so what i want to say um about ayahuasca really quick though is there is a uh place in Orlando, it's called Soul Quest Church, and they have applied for religious exemption for ayahuasca, but they technically do not have it. But because they're in a legal gray area, the DEA does not want to actually deny any of these right now because that means that then they're going to get into a fight and we might actually get what we want with, with legalization. So they're just like ignoring the applications. It's been going on for four or five years now. So they uh, do announce that they are legally allowed to serve ayahuasca. They have not had any problems with law enforcement. I've talked to the facilitators directly. I've questioned and grilled them. But I don't know that I necessarily can recommend that to someone. So my suggestion is to start with the capi microdosing because you get to know the vine, you get the same benefits of the medicine without the psychoactive experience. And then 
if you come to a place where you're able to go out of the country or access an ayahuasca ceremony, you can then have that experience. You don't have to wait for that to meet this medicine and, and to have the effects of it. You do have to be prepared with ayahuasca that it's not always a good experience. You are going to probably get violently ill like you would with peyote. I have, uh -huh. and I, I really don't have the curiosity to do that, but I've known many people who have done it. Kathy interests me though. I mean, where do you, where does one find that? Or is it through you? Well, um, it is and it isn't through me. So I, uh, at this time, I don't sell uh, bottles of medicine to anyone other than clients. It doesn't mean that you have to necessarily spend a bunch of money or anything. I, I sell it for the same price or less than, than the source I would share. Um, but if you just wanted to like try it and you didn't want to work with me, um, I am going to be starting a microdosing group soon. And there's not a charge to do that. It's just a charge for the medicine. And like I said, after a month, you should really be on your own. But if you want to purchase a bottle and you don't want to participate in that, that's okay. Um, I have a source I can share. It's a friend who lives in uh, Washington State, and all of her medicine is uh, sourced from Peru, ethically, um, from a retreat center. And I actually know people that live there as well. So I actually have a personal, you know, take on this entire source. Um, so I can recommend that if someone is interested. Um, I would like to ask you like how your process is. So if somebody would be interested in, in trying any of these that you guide them, um, how do you start the process? I mean, do you teleconference with them or do you speak to them on the phone? Um, what, you know, how many sessions would you have? Mm -hmm. Um, so <laughs> what's always so funny for me in these spaces, so, and thank you in advance for everyone for bearing with me, is uh, the nature of my work is, is very intuitive. Uh, the way I learn and I evaluate and I assess is a lot of times it's very intangible and it's very internal and it's something I've just cultivated over time and it's very much dialed into a person. So like I said before, my goals are to make these medicines accessible to appropriate people who are interested. So I work around someone's lifestyle. When I serve combo, I go to people's homes a lot of the time so that they're in the comfort of their own home. Um, this is like having personal service. So whether we're through a video chat or a phone call or whatever method you wanna use. I um, have also treated myself for complex PTSD very successfully using these medicines. And so sometimes I work with people who are just not, they're not doing a lot of interaction when we start. You know, I just really try to meet you where you are, mm -hmm. so. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Now, if anybody has any questions, we're, we're a little over our time, but I do want to leave it open for questions because you probably do have them. Uh, what I'll do is we'll leave it up for a couple moments um, if anybody wants to ask a question that will be recorded. And then what I'll do is that I'll stop the recording. So if somebody just doesn't want to be on camera, that's understandable asking a question too. So if you feel brave and have something that you think will really um, benefit everybody to hear this question, um, even in the recording, uh, just un unmute your mic. I'm not going to just, I'm not going to unmute everybody's mic because we'll get a lot of background noise. So um, I see, I see a question that's popped up and I'm going to um, address that. So how intense is DMT? So DMT, um, you know, it varies. My recommendation to anyone seeking a DMT experience is to Tread lightly. Um, one of the things I personally recommend is I recommend a combo session if it's appropriate for you prior to DMT use. Uh, from a spiritual sense, I feel that this clears your energy field and I feel that it clears a lot of trauma stored in the body and it clears a lot of toxins and just gives you a good operating space. And I feel like you are less likely to have uh, what's considered a bad trip or integration trouble afterwards. So it totally depends on your dosing, what medicine, all of those things as far as the intensity. But what I will say is that it is, so ayahuasca does contain DMT and in that setting and in other uses of DMT, people do report more integration trouble. So my recommendation is always to have a very experienced facilitator who does a very in-depth, you know, conversation and clearing with you beforehand. So, and you yes, should be fine. <laughs> yeah, I just don't think anybody should do this on their own without, you know, a no, tour no, no, guide no. to do that. Wanna, yeah. No, no, no. DMT is not like it. Like I said, that's one that I'm not saying it's not useful. I'm just saying you really have to be cautious. And and just their practitioners a little different in this world sometimes. So yeah, if you if anyone has questions after anything, email me. You're not bothering me. It doesn't matter how small. If you think of it later, you didn't want to say it here. I'm available. So. Oh, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to thank you, Lindsay, just for the purpose of that we're going to stop the recording. 
And this is the Natural Wellness Academy, and you can find us, our email will be below this video. It's naturalwellnessacademy.org to find out about any of our mind, body, spirit certifications. And Lindsay, thank you so much. We have information for people to be able to find you. And I'm just going to stop this recording right now.